So guys, in a new live stream, Tristan Tate goes crazy about Matt Shea and his case and makes a very important promise which you do not want to miss. If you do want to join the real world, we have a link down below in the description. But obviously, Andrew was going live with Alex Jones, the interview he did on Infowars, which was fantastic. I didn't want the two events to collide one with another. But I heard all sorts of conspiracy theories. Yo, Tristan can't go online because, you know, the BBC have released new evidence against him. And all sorts of nonsense. It was simply the Andrews broadcast on InfoWars with Alex Jones. It was going live at the exact same time. So I cancelled my much awaited cigar evening to instead watch that with Andrew and so as not to compete in terms of viewership. I know most of you who are watching this did watch that. The question, I guess, is why am I not in my podcast studio and why are you joining me tonight from my garden? The reason is very simple. And I'm going to go into that after I speak about today's cigar. Now, today's cigar is actually going to remain a mystery. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm not going to tell you how much it costs. I'm going to take all the labels off and scrunch them up because today's cigar night, as you know, the cigar night is I light a cigar and I answer your questions until it's time to, uh, until the time when my cigar is finished. And then I go about my day as usual. But this cigar night is not about the cigar itself. It is about the lighter that I'm going to light it with. So, bad mic, people complaining about the sound. People complaining about the sound. Hopefully it should be fixed. People are complaining about the sound. Hopefully it should be fixed. Okay, should be fixed. And once you can hear me slightly better, I'm going to keep talking. And once you guys can hear me okay, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue and I'm going to start actually again from the beginning. So I have friends saying it's not fixed, people saying it's cutting out, people saying nope, people saying the mic is not on. Still bad, not fixed. Technical issues. Does that make a difference? We were saying sounds fine now. Did you do something in there? I'm going to keep talking into this while you're messing around with it. And hopefully someone's going to be able to hear it. Mike is good. Mike is good. Buy a 10 grand mic. <laughs> My guys have unlimited budget. Audio is good. Okay. Audio is good. That's great news. So what I'm going to do then, gentlemen, is I'm going to start again. I'm going to start completely again from the beginning. So first and foremost, I would like to apologize for canceling my cigar night that was due to air two days ago. The reason I canceled that, because there were lots of conspiracy theories on Twitter. Why did he cancel his cigar night? Did something go wrong? Is something going wrong in Tristan's life? Has nothing to do with that at all. What happened was I got word from Alex Jones over Infowars, who I will be speaking to very soon, that his interview with Andrew was about to go live on infowars.com, band.video. So I decided as not to compete with the debut of the interview with Andrew and Alex Jones, and so I could watch and enjoy the interview myself, I decided to cancel the cigar evening and stay at home and sit in front of the TV and watch Alex Jones, who I absolutely like, absolutely love. Alex Jones is the man. Everyone's spamming broke mic, but people are also replying to things that I had to say. So I'm going to take the mic out of my pocket because when it was out of my pocket, people didn't complain so much. So maybe there's some magic in that. Okay, so anyway, enough people can hear me, you can hear me okay. And the reason that we have this strange microphone set up is point number two, why you are joining me tonight from my garden and not from my illustrious, luxurious, perfect sound quality podcast studio. And the reason is very simple. The reason is because I want to be in two places at once. I want to be here on the cigar evening, which I promised everybody I was going to reschedule. And I also want to be at this gathering of my friends and brothers from within the war room. What the war room is and what the war room does, I feel today 
is more important to cover than ever because Matt Shea, the DNG, who has already been to a war room event and knows what we're about for real, is planning on releasing a hit piece on the war room, as he does. It's the nature of snakes. So before Matt, the DNG, talks about the war room in a negative light, I thought, I'm here with the war room guys. I have to do a cigar evening. Why not just let them see it for themselves? As you know, with cigar nights, the way they typically work is this. I tell you about a cigar. I tell you about its quality, how it was rolled, where it's from, the flavorings of it. And then I light the cigar with a standard cigar lighter. And by the time the cigar is over, the cigar night's done. I go about my business and I'm finished answering your questions and bringing up the topics that you want to hear me speak about. However, today, this cigar, which is a fantastic cigar, has no wrapper, has no paper on it. So you can't identify exactly what the cigar is because the cigar night isn't about the cigar. You see, the cigar is not the main character of the cigar night. What is, however, is the lighter. I recently purchased the lighter. You can check the price yourself because the price varies from different countries. Made by DuPont. And it is a roulette wheel, complication, white gold, ruby encrusted DuPont with a real spinning roulette wheel where every time I press it, you can probably hear it, even though the mic's bad, spins 26 black. It's your lucky number if you're gambling tonight. Again, 22 black. And I know what you're going to ask, and I'm going to get into this in a second. Tristan, why would you spend 55,000 American dollars on a lighter? Why did you buy it for? And the answer is very simple, to light my cigars. Because this, although it's an intricate piece of jewelry with a Swiss watch mechanism and rubies and jewels, etc., it also has this really cool feature where if you flick it, flames come out. And you can use that flame to light your cigarettes and cigars, which is what I'm going to do. What an incredible invention. It's certainly worth $55,000. I mean, if you were to offer a caveman this level of technology, roulette wheel, the caveman would know how to gamble. Gambling is around, don't gamble. But the technology to make fire from your bare hands, the caveman would think it was worth $55,000 or whatever the equivalent currency was at that time. But today, everybody thinks, oh, no, you can get plastic layers. You don't need a $55,000 cigar lighter, but they're wrong. Which brings me on to my first topic of today's cigar evening, which is... Rich people making stupid and gratuitous purchases because many people, since I've purchased that lighter, I've showed it to them, have said either, wow, what a work of art. That's a piece of jewelry in your hands. It's absolutely amazing. What an accessory to go with your fine cubic cigars. But a few people have said, what a waste of money. You should not have wasted 55,000 American dollars on a lighter. Here's why they're wrong. I'm going to tell you a little story about when I was younger. I used to work as a security guard in a nightclub. And I used to see rich people, or people with money to waste, go into that nightclub when I was making 100 pounds a day, and they used to spend money on drinks and champagne upwards of 10, 20, 30,000 pounds. You know how people do it in London. I'm still having microphone complaints, Bailey. So now as I sit here as a 34-year-old man, everyone's saying shift the audio, fix mic. Mic's okay, roll with it. Some people are saying it's okay. Look, guys, the sound isn't as good, but I'm outside for a reason. Sound is muffled, allegedly. Hopefully that's better. If that's not better, everyone else can kiss my ass. If this is not better, you can all get lost. Hopefully it's okay now, because he literally just swapped the microphone. Mike is mid. Okay, if it's mid, get over it. I'm not inside the podcast studio. I'm outside. The wind is blowing. The sun is shining. Planes are flying overhead. If the sound is not perfect, literally get over it. Muffled, fine. Great. There's a spamming. Fine. And with, it comes to rich people making stupidly expensive gratuitous purchases. 
when I was young, I thought it was stupid. You see, I know there are people at home saying, oh, you know, well, we spent $55,000 on a lighter. That's not okay. I'll tell you why it is okay. And I'll tell you why it makes perfect sense for me. As a young man working in a nightclub for 100 pounds a day, and I saw people spend 20, 30,000 pounds on champagne, I think, oh man, what a waste. Because if I had 30,000 pounds, I'd buy a new bed. My bed was fucked. Oh, I'd upgrade my car. I'd buy some nice clothes. I'd go on a nice vacation. These people are stupid. Really, I was stupid. And the reason I was stupid is because I should have realized that by the time a man has the money where he could spend 30,000 pounds on drinks on a Friday, that his bed isn't broken, his car is perfectly fine, top of the range, he has a light house, he can go on vacation whenever he likes. So I know that people are going to say that this life is a waste, but it's a thing of beauty, it's a work of art, and I like it. And $55,000 to me is not what $55,000 is to most people. And if I like this lighter and I want to light my cigarettes and my cigars with it, then why shouldn't I have it? Because it doesn't make much of a difference to me. If I were to spend $50 on a lighter back when I was broke, people wouldn't think that was necessarily that stupid. But I only used to make about $50 a day working in my fast food jobs, for example. I make more than $55,000 a day. This is less than a day's work. It's fine. So I like this lighter, and that's what the cigar meeting today is about. It's not about the cigar, it's about this lighter, which I'm going to put on display for all of you to look at. I'm going to try and get the gold one if it comes up for sale. There's only 88 of these in the entire world, and this is number 5 of 88. So I'm going to try and get the gold one, but until then, you're going to have to look at this one on my cigar nights. It's absolutely wonderful. Now, another question, which brings me to why I'm sitting here in my garden today, is, oh, you spent $55,000 on a lighter. You could have given that money to charity. Motherfuckers. What's wrong with you? I am so tired of purchasing things and hearing from people who do nothing for charity and who do nothing for anyone else in the world what I could have done with that money instead that they would prefer me to do with it. I give a lot more than the cost of that lighter to charity and that is actually why I'm sitting here in my garden today. In a moment, a bunch of people are gonna come out of the house when they're finished talking and giving their speeches. And they are members of the War Room. And the War Room members are here this weekend in a gathering to raise money for charity. The War Room does events, which teaches various things, how to dress, how to behave, how to act like a gentleman, how to shoot, uh, technical skills, sales, things that benefit you in life, things that help you grow as a man. But the War Room, unlike the previous meetings we've done this weekend, I decided to just host a bunch of War Room dudes in my house. Everybody donated mon amounts of money to Cherry at random, and the first 50 people got to come to my house to speak to me. I think that one of the guys only donated a couple hundred bucks. It was all he had. But here he is invited to my home in Romania. I want to make something very, very clear. I do not allow strangers into my house, but the war room are not strangers. A hit piece is coming out on the war room. Matt, the DNG, is working on it. But what the war room really is, is the network of men who all share the same vision in life. They share the same attitudes, the same goals, the same aspirations, the same values. That's who the war room is. I used to hear many years ago that you only ever have five real friends. And I believed it. I believed it. I believed that you were very lucky to find five real friends ever in your life. And the reason is because the world is not set up to make friends. If you're a man of value and integrity, you have to walk through the world and by chance, every once in a while, when you meet a new man and meet a new guy, find that he shares the same values as you and then take the opportunity to speak to him. You're not going to find people like that. So I had very few friends most of my life and a lot of you will probably find yourself with fewer than five real friends right now where you are. I have more than a hundred friends. A hundred men I could trust with my daughter, with my money, with business. I could let them borrow my cars. That's because these men I met from within the war room. People ask me questions like, how did you and Justin Waller meet? Everyone loves Justin Waller. He's becoming more prominent on the internet. He's a big voice. And everyone's like, oh, you're friends with Justin Waller. Where did you meet him? Justin Waller joined the war room. And now he is one of my best friends. And I have many friends, some I can name, some I cannot who I've made friends because they've joined this organization. So the War Room is absolutely wonderful. Male relationships, platonic male friendships, are something that's lacking in this world today. It's something that the Matrix and the mass media try to belittle 
they tried to say isn't important. They they tried to make it gay, but it's not. Male companionship and male friendship is one of the most important things in any man's life. And if you lack it, you're not going to have a very happy and fulfilled life. You're going to have all the women in the world. If you haven't got a friend or brother who's got your back when times get hard, you're going to struggle. So that's what the war room really is and what the war room is really about. So they're all here because they donated money to Tate Pledge. I would like you all to go to tatepledge.com because I'm not Mr. Producer. I don't have the ability to spam a bunch of videos here, but I'm sure we will in the next emergency meeting. But we've been doing some amazing work in Syria, some amazing work in Palestine. And the way that Tate Pledge works is very simple. It's not a charity that tries to make money because we have no CEO, we have no HR, we don't film TV commercials. Everything that we do, the goal is towards providing children, primarily in war-torn countries, with food and water. So we build pipes, sewage systems, water pumps, and of course we provide thousands and thousands of meals daily to parts of the world that are struggling. We also finance schools in Syria to make sure that young boys and girls in, in uh, the war-torn country of Syria can get a good education. And the good thing about Tate Pledge is, because I'm so fucking rich, when these gentlemen who are here at my house donate money to Tate Pledge, all of the money, all of it, goes to the people on the ground. Obviously, the people take, you know, there's a very small salary paid to the workers who actually go into sourcing the food, the teachers who go into, you know, running the school, and everything else goes straight to the people who need it the most. So it's probably the most efficient charity in the world because I'm just a rich man trying to give, trying to give back, trying to help people. When you donate money to Oxfam with their expensive TV commercials and their CEO who makes six million a year or something crazy, how much of that money do you actually think goes to the people who are hungry? the people who are starving. Let me tell you something. What shocked me when I started this charity project two years ago was this. I can't believe how cheap things are in the third world. We're sometimes providing meals, big meals that fill people's stomachs for 40 cents, 30 cents. Sometimes they're a dollar, sometimes they're two dollars. But when I think of all the billions, billions with a B, donated to charity since the 1960s and 70s, since Live Aid was a big thing, I think, what the fuck have these charities actually been doing? Because if you give me access to the kind of money that these charities have, no one in the world and no child would ever be hungry ever fucking again. I'm doing my part. It's not perfect, but I'm doing my absolute best. And I'm telling you that things in the third world are exceptionally cheap, and you could do a lot with a little. If you are not selfish, if you're not in it for profit, like me and my brother are. So, all the gentlemen who are about to come out here and start smoking cigars and having drinks and eating great food have raised over $200,000 in one weekend, and all of that goes directly to the Tate Pledge, and that's why you're joining me in my garden. So, I've had a few topics that I wanted to talk about today, because I get asked a few questions, and there were some that were very, very interesting for the, for the last uh, cigar night that actually didn't take place. So I've covered why I'm here. I've covered why I'm outside. But we're going to get into the meat of the cigar night. Now, everyone obviously watched me trounce Andrew in a race on the streets. If you haven't seen it, go to rumble.com slash take confidential. Me and Andrew engaged in a race where he took his $660,000 McLaren 765LT. There's only about 800 of those in the world. The remaining authorities, Seacott, have one of mine. I'm going to talk about them at the end of this podcast. And I was driving, of course, my 1979 Lada 1500, and I won the race. How did I win the race? Everyone asked me, Tristan, why do you drive that Lada around? I think some of you get it. If you're from Eastern Europe, if you're from Romania, Russia, Ukraine, uh, Moldova, Belarus, you understand the comedic value of driving a Lada around. But a lot of people in the world don't get it. So why do I drive a 1979 Euro? communist Soviet Union built piece of shit car. I'm going to tell you why I do it. One, because I have every other car in the world and I think it's special. And I'm going to tell you the reasons why it is special. Here's what you have to understand about business. Business works because of competition. That's the way the economy works in capitalism. This cigar, bad example. You'll laugh at me if you know why. This laptop, is made by Apple. Apple is a company in California. Other companies make laptops. They all make their laptops. And they try to make them cheaper and better and more efficient and faster with better features than other laptops at a lower price point. And the people who nail 
the quality for price point mark tend to win in competition. So my Lada was not built in a state of competition. Ford, Hyundai, Honda, BMW, Audi. Today in the car market, they're all competing one against each other. McLaren, they want to make a car that's faster, better, the best features at the lowest possible price point so people can actually afford to buy it. And the companies that are the most successful at this stay in business, sell the most cars, and become the most popular. Where the Lada was built at a very different time, and this is why communism doesn't work. It was built in the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union works something like this. Okay, I'm the government who owns everything. There's no private companies. There's no private industry. I am the government. Our people need cars to drive. Propose to me some designs. Well, comrade, this is called a Lada. I can build these at the factory that's owned by the government. And it drives and it moves. Okay, good. That's a car. Make Ladas. The people in Russia drive Ladas. No choice, no competition, no foreign imports. That's the way it works. So it's actually a time capsule. I'm sitting next to it right here. It's right here in front of me. It's actually a time capsule to a completely different time in human history and civilization, which I don't think we're ever going to see ever again unless North Korea start producing motor vehicles, which they probably won't. So I like the Lada. I think it's very special. I think it's very unique. And that is the reason I drive it. I also drive it because I like it. And if you don't like it, then you could fuck off. But that brings me into competition. Because competition is super important. And that is another aspect of the war room that people don't understand. Men need other men to compete against. The reason Ferraris and McLarens and Aston Martins are so fantastic is because these three companies are competing one against the other to provide the best, fastest possible car, the best product. You yourself need something to measure yourself against and somebody to compete against to become the best version of yourself. I will tell you right now, as rich as I am, I am currently not the richest man in my house. There is a man here who is richer than me. He is a member of the war room. That makes me strive and want to be more successful. Yesterday, everybody here was doing some boxing. Of course, when Matt Shea partook in war room boxing, he was, oh no, he punched me in the face. This is assault. Why does he want to do this? You compete in boxing because the ability to be violent and to protect your friends and your family and your loved ones and your possessions is integral to being a man. And some people did much better because some are experienced boxers and experienced fighters, and some are not. And those who are not today are promising us, promising us as their group of friends, as their group of brothers, that they are going to do better in themselves. They're going to train harder. And when I see them again, they're going to do better. We have people who are striving in business, people who are inspired by me, people who are inspired by the guy who's here is rich than me. I'm not going to say his name. And a few of the other people who are like, I'm going to be at the point you are if you give me more. And if he's not pathetic, holding yourself accountable and competing with other men is super important to being an optimum man, an optimum human being, which is why McLarens are technically better than Lava. See how I... Aikido roped it back in. Skill. So competition between men is super important. That is another aspect of what we do in the war room. So these men's donate, how much the individual engagement pledge have not been made public. But the top 10 donors have uh, been congratulated. Um, the top five are going to have people on the ground uh, in personalized thank yous uh, for, the, for the financial contributions they made, the meals they provided because you know, it lifts the heart. It makes people feel good. So, and the other people in the room are thinking, okay, well, I came here, I didn't donate that much money, but next time we run a fundraiser like this, we can expect to raise a quarter of a million dollars. A quarter of a million dollars in a weekend to feed starving children. But that's not what people want to say about me, is it? That's not what the media want to say about me. So I'm going to talk about the main topic of today's Cigar Night, because I'm only going to be online for about 35, 40 minutes. It's not going to be as long as many of my others. I'm going to get to your super chats at the end. The big bombshell has dropped. Ladies and gentlemen, if you trust the BBC, I'm going to tell you they actually got something right. The BBC got access to the case file, the indictment that was submitted to judges to say these men are human traffickers and these men are guilty. Now, this is a bombshell, ladies and gentlemen, and the BBC actually reported factually. So you would think, after one and a half years 
of investigating me. After spying on me and following me for six months, after locking me in a prison cell for three months, after going through every electronic device I have ever owned, after searching every property that I have ever had, after talking to every girl who I have ever made love with, they have completed this indictment to show the judge that I'm a human trafficker and the BBC have got their hands on it and the BBC are leaking information from the file. So given the millions of dollars spent, millions spent trying to prove I'm something I'm not, given the massive amounts of human resources used to try to prove that I'm a human trafficker, the indictment says the bombshell the worst thing the BBC could possibly find, because believe me, they want to find the worst thing, is that I once referred to my girlfriend as a slave. Think about that. BBC, if you're listening, that isn't the bombshell that you think it is. If I were a left-wing political pundit and a social justice warrior and somebody who used virtue signaling, like you all do, when you cover up pedophiles and sex offenders like Hugh Edwards. If I were like you and you found a message of me saying to my ex-girlfriend, you're my slave, you could probably leak that and get me fired from a job at the BBC. But let me tell you something. I did write that. All of my WhatsApp conversations for my last four years were read in fine detail by the authorities to try to prove that I'm a human trafficker. Okay? I did in fact write that my ex-girlfriend was my slave. Now, here's the important takeaways from that. Can you imagine what should be in this case file? If I am the man they say I am, there should be chains, dungeons, handcuffs, urine-stained mattresses, messages saying, bitch, get back out on the street, me selling people, transactions, I'll meet you here, I have three girls for sale, proof I have anyone traveled anywhere, me physically moving people from one place to another. That's what human trafficking is. Why, if the BBC got their hands on the indictment, do they print a story that says, I called my ex-girlfriend a slave? Because, ladies and gentlemen, this is the great end cell. The BBC lined this up for me. That is as bad as the evidence against me gets. Which is insane. Because the girl who I called a slave obviously as a joke one did not make a complaint about me two is protesting that i'm innocent three has told everybody i'm a lovely person and uh, four it's not even about the girls who lied and came here i wasn't even talking about them when i said someone's my slave so you have to ask yourself a question does me what staying on whatsapp oh don't worry she'll clean the house she's my slave does that merit locking me, my brother, and my friends up in a fucking prison for three months, subjecting us and our families to the worst forms of physical and psychological torture, locking us in our houses. I haven't been free since December 2022. I'm still not free now. If I leave the city limits of Bucharest, I will be arrested and thrown back in jail because I once said a girl is my slave. I did say that, BBC. You got that right. But you have miscalculated how underwhelming that is, as a bombshell, after this level of media storm and investigation. Yeah. Let me give you another example. While I light my cigar with my $55,000 lighter. If you're one of the investigators, obviously trying to put me in jail. If you're an immoral person, you'll never own one of these. Gonna put God first. Start doing the right thing. I had a conversation one week ago with the mother of my daughter. She sent me an image of my daughter drawing with crayons on the walls of the house. And I said, ha ha, I'll kill her when I get home. Now, I did say that. Cut it up, take it out of context as much as you like, spread it around the world. Because I said that, would you think it was prudent to spend millions of dollars investigating me for potentially being a homicidal child murderer? Would you think it prudent to take me and my brother and my friend and lock us in prison for month after month after month while you investigated the possibility 
that we run an organized criminal group that conspires to kill children when no children are harmed, no children are murdered, no crime has ever taken place, but I did say in a message, I'll kill her when I get home. That is exactly the same as what has happened to me, ladies and gentlemen, because the core of the evidence, the piece of evidence that makes me look the worst is me saying, ha ha, this girl's my slave, she'll clean the house, he's my slave. Does that mean I enslave people? I am a half black man. I am a descendant of African American slaves. Does me making a joke that my ex-girlfriend was my slave mean that I'm in fact a slave owner? You can make up your own mind, ladies and gentlemen. And I encourage all of the affiliates and uh, TikTokers out there to cut this argument up and, and put it out there because this is the bombshell that the BBC have dropped. I'm gonna give you another example of evidence leaked from the case file that's in the news that I would like to address. One girl who is friends with another girl, we've all seen, I'm not allowed to talk to these people, and I do not talk to these people, I wanna make that perfectly clear. We've all seen the girls online saying, I'm a victim in this case file, I've told the police to take me out, I'm not a victim, this is my friendship group, they're all my friends, no one's human traffic, drop the investigation, this is bullshit. Everyone's seen those girls. These are girls in the case file, listed as victims. Everyone's seen them protest my innocence online probably 20, 30 times. They keep doing it. I'm not telling them to. I have no communication with them. But because they care about us and they care about Georgiana, Luana, and the other girls involved in the case, they are actively fighting to uh, get their names removed as victims from the case file. Now, bombshell from the case file. Ready? Strap yourselves into your seats, ladies and gentlemen. This indictment was built and put together to prove I'm a human trafficker. Bombshell from the case file. All of these girls, the girls who were locked up, the girls who are said to be victims but they're not, mess around on TikTok, as everyone does. I'm banned from TikTok, I don't have TikTok. Half the people here probably have TikTok. And they did TikTok live streams of their own accord by themselves and posted TikTok videos and all helped each other out, build each other's TikToks up. During one conversation once, with all context ignored, I'm going to say the clip first. It was said by one girl, if you don't make some TikTok videos this evening, I'm going to throw you off of a balcony. Bombshell. Wow. I guess Tristan Tate is a human trafficker. That is the second bombshell taken from this indictment. Now, I know that when girl A typed that to girl B, girl B read it and went, ha ha ha, she's so funny. I know that she was not actually seriously thinking that she was threatened of being thrown off of a balcony. Ladies and gentlemen, the house she lives in has no balcony. But that again is another bombshell from the file. So when the BBC think it's fun to leak tiny bits of information, by the way, the full conversation, which wasn't submitted to the judge in the indictment, they only posted that little one line. Full conversation was, hey, babe, how you doing? Oh, I'm good, babe. How are you doing? I'm fine. I was making TikTok videos today. Yeah, six o'clock is the best time to post. Oh, I didn't make any TikTok videos today. Oh, well, haha, you're lazy. If you don't make it, I'll throw you off the balcony. That was the full conversation, by the way, which is in the, the case files, but not in the indictment, because obviously they're trying to make me look guilty. So that is the second bombshell. Can you imagine if you found a real human trafficker, what would be in that case file? Can you imagine? Think about it. Someone who kidnaps, sells, and traffics women. What would be in the indictment for the judge to look at? So although the BBC and a bunch of these stupid news organizations, the MSN, the fake news, think they're very clever by leaking these tiny bits of the case to try to make me look guilty, let me explain something to them. You know who else looked at my indictment? Judges. Honorable, stand-up judges. Educated judges who understand law who understand what a crime is, who definitely understand what a joke is. And every time a prominent Romanian judge has looked at the indictment, at least one of them, if not both of them, have voted to release me and loosen my restrictions. If there was evidence in that indictment that I was actually, in fact, a human trafficker, that would not be the case. And it shouldn't be the case because human traffickers belong in jail. So. Matt Shea, the DNG, is working on a new hit piece about me. 
yeah. bombshell from the Tate's file. I called Night Scott for the slave once. Oh my God, lock me up. We'll be there. Amongst the usual probably fake witnesses, faces blacked out. I'm going to guess there's going to be a bunch of fake screenshots in there. And uh, yeah, good luck, Matt. But you're a loser and no one cares what you think. Now, I've got one question that I actually want to answer before I go back to talking about what's going on here in my house tonight. Because this, I thought, was a very interesting one. I have a social media platform. I'm not banned everywhere. I am allowed on X, formerly Twitter. And I was having a very interesting conversation with somebody, and people keep asking me about what I think about X and the future of X and how I think the free speech movement is going and how Elon is spearheading it by taking over this company. And I also get asked, hey, Talisman, do you want Instagram back? What would you do if you got Instagram back? I'm going to explain to you why I do not want Instagram back. The best thing Instagram could do for themselves as a company is to let me back immediately, today, tomorrow, reinstate my account. And I'm going to tell you why. Because if I was given my Instagram back now, I would use my Instagram. And me and my brother would have two of the biggest, most active accounts in the world. And a lot more hours we spent on Instagram, because Instagram is using the social media for. And the two biggest soldiers for any social media platform have been cut off of Instagram because of their woke ideology. The best thing Instagram could do is to allow me back on Instagram immediately. And I'm going to tell you why. <coughs> Elon Musk is too smart, and Elon Musk is going to bury Instagram. What do you mean by that, Tristan? What do you mean Elon Musk is too small? What do you mean he's going to bury Instagram? I'm going to tell you what I mean. He is going to bury Instagram for the simple reason that Elon Musk is Elon Musk. Give me five minutes. Before Mark Zuckerberg got into the social media game with Facebook, who was he? He was a guy who built websites. Some guy in college who built websites. Jack from Twitter. That guy from MySpace, forgot his name, Tom. Who were they? Guys who could build websites. And they built these websites. The websites took off. They were one of the first things, I guess, to go viral. Do you have a Facebook profile? Do you? Oh, I do. And they spread around the world. These people make billions of dollars in the process. Billions. But they are just guys who build websites. I have not seen a single thing from any of these men besides their initial websites, that has impressed me at all. Remember Mark Zuckerberg's Metaverse? How many people use the Metaverse? Zero. It looked like a cheap, bad graphics, World of Warcraft style office simulator. And surprise, 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 with billions invested in that, it didn't take off, poor Mark Zuckerberg. Facebook did, because Facebook was, I guess, a relatively new idea. Instagram did, relatively new idea. But these guys are just guys who built a website and in a way got lucky. That's why they will never ever be able to compete with top E, space master, king of the low earth orbit, Elon Musk. And I'm going to explain to you why. Elon Musk isn't just some dork who built a website. Elon Musk is a killer. Elon Musk took over businesses like Tesla, an electric car company, and everyone laughed at him and laughed at the concept and turned it into the most successful, one of the most successful car companies on planet Earth. But planet Earth wasn't enough for Elon Musk. No, no, no. Elon Musk took to the stars. He looked at rockets built by NASA and the Soviet Union during the space race by pioneers like Warner von Braun, who were geniuses, former Nazi, genius nonetheless, and said, this isn't good enough. After the rocket shoots in space, we should be able to land them afterwards. Everyone laughed at him. They laughed at him and laughed at him. NASA astronauts laughed at him. And he fucking pulled it off. He built the fucking dream. He's going to space. He owns one of the most successful car companies in the world. He may even fucking revolutionize transport within cities if the boring company takes off. We'll see. With his hyperloop. Absolute killer. He's a monster. So who was Elon Musk before he got into the social media game? Elon Musk was Elon Musk. And now he's taken over a social media platform. This isn't some dork who built a site. This is arguably the smartest man on the planet. 
Because I believe intellect alone isn't enough. I believe intellect applied proves intelligence. Oh, this kid has an IQ of 170. Great. What have they done? Nothing. Stephen Hawking hated people bragging about their IQ. I don't even know what Elon Musk's IQ is. I imagine it's high enough. But he has applied intellect and become one of the most become the most successful man on earth. You can't argue with results. If you do better, you do better. Elon Musk is the smartest man alive, as far as I'm concerned. And he now runs X. Let me tell you something. Instagram for banning me. YouTube. All of you people for banning me. I think your time is limited. Because I think you've been a little cage of chickens running around pecking at each other and a lion has just been released into your chicken coop and i think you are done i think you are finished so i will say it one more time to the social media platforms you thought it was a great idea to ban me for trying to motivate young men and for doing car reviews and dressing in nice suits i'm going to tell you right now the best thing you could do is to unban me now and make hay while the sun shines because when elon musk and X kills Instagram, when engagement on all these platforms drops to near zero, when X is a payment processor and a way you can send money to each other and to store your photos, and when these people on Instagram with millions of followers who get nothing in return are doing the same thing on X and getting big checks every month for the interaction that they cause on the website because Elon is a man who is honorable and your platforms are dying, then, and only then, I believe you may make the decision to bring back Tristan Tate, to bring back Andrew Tate. What a revolutionary headline. Tristan and Andrew Tate back on Instagram. And if you do it too late, when X is already burying your profile, I'm going to upload a picture of Elon saying Elon owns this platform. Go to X.com. So now it's your chance, social media companies in the world. That's what I think about the future of social media. And that's what I think about what's happening. That was one of the main questions I wanted to answer tonight. This broadcast is going to be a lot shorter than a lot of them, because of course, all of my esteemed guests and colleagues are over here, waiting for me to join them for drinks and conversation to celebrate how much money we've given to charity and the great things we've done. And hopefully, so we can network and make a few new business partners, maybe even some new friends. Crystal clear to all of you out there, I only make my friends from within the war room. I only make my friends from within the war room. Because I know before I speak to you, before I invest the two hours it takes to get to know you, that you are at least aligned with my values. And the war room's values are simple. Strength, honor, physicality, intellect, bettering yourself, becoming the best version of a man that you could possibly become. I await the hit piece from Matt Shea, the DNG. All of the men in the war room were making a promise to each other. A promise to themselves and a promise to each other about the next time we meet up. Because men need to hold each other accountable. I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to lose this much body fat. I'm going to make this much more money. I'm going to have read 40 books. I'm going to have done this. I'm going to have done that. And they repeated their promise in front of 30 or 40 different men here in my house. Because he, you know, he knows by saying it in front of us that we're going to hold him accountable for it. So I think I'm going to end this broadcast after just 45 short minutes with the promise that I made to the men of the war room. You see, I make lots of promises to myself every day, and I make lots of promises to my brother. And I never, ever disappoint myself. But if you repeat a promise in public, it becomes more real. If I give my word to the 400,000 people who will eventually watch this podcast. It means something. And what I promised to the men in my house was very simple. Everybody in life has these goals and these aspirations, and they're giving examples about wanting to have more children, you know, wanting to improve their relationship with their kids. I right now couldn't give an example because I don't know what my future has in store for me. For one of the first times in my life, my destiny is no longer in my own hand. I am not the sculptor molding the clay. Ideally, and going by what's happening right now, the judges, who are clearly talented, wonderful people, are making the correct decisions every time. So hopefully it's only a matter of time before a series of correct decisions sees me liberated and sees this ugly chapter of my life behind me. But there is also a possibility 
I guess because I am wrapped up in the legal system. Not that I'm guilty of any crime, but that for some reason I will see myself in prison for five years, 10 years. God knows the people who are trying to do this to me are powerful and they are determined. The judges are what are standing in their way. God bless them. Here's my promise that I made to the war room and I'm gonna make the same promise to all of you, my friends and fans who join me on these wonderful cigar evenings. My promise is this, no matter what they do to me, I will never ever ever break down crying like some other prominent masculinity coaches and male mentors out there in the world who cry like babies all the time when they're asked hard questions or when they go through hard times. I will never mentally break I will never become an alcohol or a drug addict. I will never go to a therapist. I will never say I have depression. I will never apologize for anything I've ever said. And I will never apologize for anything I've ever done because the Lord knows I've broken no laws and committed no crimes. I will never apologize for being who I am. I find it very strange that when somebody has a sexual deviation or they say that they're a transgender, they can say, I was born this way. And they instantly get let off the hook for anything wrong they do. I have done nothing wrong. But this is a quote from Ice Cube, actually, in his interview with Tucker Carlson. He said, you know what? I was born this way, too. And I feel that. That's who I am. I am Tristan Tate. I will never break down. I will never falter. I will never apologize. I will never stop talking to you. I will never go offline. I will never stop streaming on Rumble. I will never stop posting my opinions on X. I'm going to continue to talk and continue to be me. And I will never, ever, ever let them mentally break me or let them mentally upset me. To the people who are trying to do this to me, you will never, ever, ever get to me. I will go to jail for the rest of my life with my chin held high and a smile on my face because I know I'm innocent. Most of the world knows I'm innocent and I know who I am. So that's my promise to the world. You can always count on me. And for all of you out there who send me nice messages all the time saying, I look up to you like a bigger brother. I look up to you like a father. For some of the younger guys, I'm always going to be here for you. They're going to have to kill me to stop.